Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is John Rood, um, founder and CEO of Perceptual, and I am happy to be joined today by Mark Girard um, from Nylon Johnson Lewis, uh, an attorney. Hi, Mark. Hi, John. Um, well, Mark, thanks for, for joining me today. We're planning today to talk um, for, oh, you know, maybe 20, 30 minutes. Um, and our discussion today is going to be a kind of wide ranging and casual conversation around the world of um, HR regulation, specifically around um, artificial intelligence, which I know is something that um, has been of interest to both of us. Um, I'd love, Mark, maybe you just give us a little bit of your background and a little bit of kind of your uh, your particular interest areas. Yeah, certainly. So, um, John, thanks for the opportunity to chat today. Um, so I'm an employment attorney here in Minneapolis at Nyland Johnson Lewis, as you mentioned. Uh, I've been practicing in this area for about 20 years now and primarily represent employers. So I guess what we would call management side employment law. One of my areas of specialty is around pre-employment selection and screening. So everything from you know personality tests to cognitive tests to other types of tools that employers use to assess potential talent through screening tools. So that's things like background checks and, and, and those kinds of processes. And I'd say over the last um, probably five years, maybe six years, as I've been advising clients on their use of pre-employment selection tools in particular, I've increasingly been getting questions about artificial intelligence-based selection tools as those have become, I'd say, more prevalent in the marketplace. So I guess with, with those questions, I began to have an interest in this area. And then over the last maybe three or four years, have begun to see a number of uh, municipalities, states, and then federal um, enforcement agencies begin to also take an interest um, in in the use of AI in hiring and selection and um, beginning to issue some regulations and laws in this space as well. Gotcha. Um, that's an amazing background. I think what, I, what I'd like to do is you know, I, I want to talk about AI in a second, but you've got such a such a wealth of experience going back, as you mentioned, decades. So as you think about, you know, your practice before the last three years when AI was was a big part of this, um, I wonder if you could give just like a quick overview, like what are the, the core issues with pre-hiring assessment that I guess I would say like a, an HR practitioner, but not a legal expert should know about? Yeah, so, so I'd say there are two bundles of issues, and both of these stem from federal legal requirements. Um, and the, the first set is around the potential for any selection tool, and, and that can be anything from a, you know, a structured interview to a pre-employment assessment um, to have adverse impact against candidates based on race or gender. So the idea there is if, if a tool selects people from one race or ethnic group or one gender group at a, at a statistically significantly different rate than members of another group, that is considered prima facie evidence of disparate impact discrimination. Um, once that evidence is present, employers um, can show that their tool is job related and consistent with business necessity. This is a concept that, you know, I think in the in the legal setting, we call job related and consistent with business necessity. In the selection science space, I think you would call that validity is the term that's used. But but basically it's an opportunity to document that your tool is assessing for <clears throat> characteristics that are important for success in the job. Um, that it is doing so with some degree of accuracy, um, and that there's not another tool out there that would be equally valid but less likely to have adverse impact. So, so that's kind of the first bundle of issues in terms of employers, what it means kind of from a practical sense is that they should be assessing whether their selection processes do have adverse impact based on race and gender at least once a year. Um, and if so, make sure that they have documentation that the tools they're using are actually valid um, for the purposes for which they're using them. Um, the, the other set of issues comes up under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, the, the ADA has certain um, requirements regarding when and how employers can use medical examinations or make medical inquiries in the hiring process. And 
And there's been a fair amount of attention and litigation, I think, in particular on personality assessments mm -hmm. and whether those are effectively functioning as medical exams or, you know, screening for disability. Um, and if so, there are, you know, stages at which the process, so, sorry, stages in the hiring process during which medical exams can't be used. In particular, they can't be used until after a conditional job offer has been made. Um, and then if they're used, they have to be job related. So there are, you know, I guess, timing rules and, um, and again, kind of validity rules around uh, selection tools that might function effectively like a medical exam because they, they reveal information about disability. Gotcha. Okay. That's very interesting. Um, I want to go back to something that you said. So you were talking about how if there is a disparate impact used by a tool that the employer can show that the tool um, both is job related, but then also they have, they have the burden of showing that the tool, that, that nothing else can be used in place of that tool. How can an employer prove that? Yeah, it's so I would say it's not unusual. And, um, you know, if an employer is using so so let's say it's a um, cognitive test, or, or maybe make it a little more complicated than that. So it's a, a pre employment test that includes some cognitive components. It includes a, a maybe an inbox exercise or some other kind of um, test like that. And then maybe some personality scales. Um, the, the vendor who developed that test should be able to prepare what's called a validation study report to say, you know, we, we assessed your job. We determined what characteristics are important for that job. We, we developed a tool or put together components of a tool that predict for those important characteristics. And then in that discussion, you would say, and we explored other, and, and, and the question is, what's that other? I know that that's the part that I think is, I think tr troubling for some employers because they say, you know, does that mean we also have to explore would an interview be as effective? Would a, you know, a completely different type of tool be as effective and equally valid? The, the law doesn't require employers to go that far, but what it does require is that you, you know, when you're looking at that, let's say the combination of those different types of components we looked at, to, to look at, you know, is, is there a way we can weight the importance of those different parts of the test? Are there changes we can make to the, you know, the scoring algorithm um, that's going to lead to an eventual score on the test that are let that are equally or, you know, close to as valid, but less likely to have adverse impact. So it's pretty typical in one of these validation study reports to have a section where the vendor will talk about efforts they made to explore other other kind of mixes or flavors of the same test in a way to minimize the potential for adverse impact, but without sacrificing the validity and the predictiveness of the tool. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. That's great background. Let's try to move over to um, a, a discussion about how your practice has changed over the last three years as you've gotten more questions about AI. And I think that, you know, as, as our discussion progresses, you will probably dive into, into specific um, legislation. But, you know, one thing that was interesting to me about what you had said was we are now, I mean, we're recording this in early 2023, and some of the laws are just going into effect now, the very early laws. But over the last couple of years, like what, what are the questions have you been getting from, from vendors and from employers specific to AI and how have you been uh, addressing them? Yeah, I would say, and, and I may go back a little further than the last couple of years because I probably started getting these questions, I'd say maybe six or so years ago. And it's when um, clients were looking at implementing a new selection tool and they put it out for you know a request for proposals and they started to get proposals from new players in the field, which were, you know, data sciences firms that had a artificial intelligence based tool. And, and, and I'd say in early days, it was fairly rudimentary tools. So it was um, resume scraping, scraping tools or other things like that. Um, and so the questions were, you kind know, of what what is this thing? Um, the, the vendor is telling us they can develop and implement it much more cheaply than a traditional assessment. Um, and, you know, our HR folks are very excited about that, or our procurement folks are very excited about that. And, and, and so what, what is this thing and can we be exploring it? 
Um, I'd say it found over a couple of years, I had a number of conversations with those vendors where I would say, you know, this seems like a great tool. Mm -hmm. um, can you show me what you can do to prepare a validation study report that's compliant with federal standards? And, and they would sort of scratch their heads and say, well, our, our tool is valid, which, which has a really different meaning in the, um, the data sciences space. Mm -hmm than in the um, selection science space where it where it's a, a legal term of art mm -hmm. um, rather than a question of is the tool performing in the way you expect it to perform. Um, I would say over over a period of a few years, I saw the the AI tool providers get much more sophisticated in this space, mm -hmm. where I think they were hearing these questions not just from me, but from other you know in-house and outside legal counsel. Um, and, and many of them began to bring industrial organizational psychologists in-house who could kind of do the work of preparing a validation study report to show that their tool was, you know, was valid in a way that stood up under those federal legal standards. So, so that was the first shift. And then I'd say the second shift has really been in the last, probably since 2019, um, as we've started to see uh, more legislation and regulation in this space. Okay. Yeah, that background makes a lot of sense. Let's then dive into kind of the world of legislation and regulation as as we as we see it today. Um, I wonder if you can talk through. Um, and this is a this is a pretty broad question, so take it whichever way you want. But talk yeah. through some of the legislation that you're watching carefully, and then what I'd love to do is ultimately kind of get to what are the what are the trends or common threads um, that vendors and that especially employers and HR leaders can be can be watching for. Yeah, and you know, I think John, that's a great question about the trends and threats because it really is something that has been evolving since you know I'd say the the first step into this space was the state of Illinois, which adopted um, it's called the Illinois, I believe it's the Artificial Intelligence Video Interview Act. I may be maybe butchering the exact name there, but basically it was a law that regulated the use of artificial intelligence to score video interview results. And I'd say this came out of a lot of press around the time about AI-based selection tools that were using facial recognition um, to score candidates. And, and really, I think, were um, using characteristics that were very hard to, to understand how they were actually related mm -hmm. to performance on a job. So, you know, the, the tool development may have shown that, you know, particular microfacial expressions in, in a large set of data, you know, might be associated with job performance. Um, but it was very hard for people to understand how does that actually have anything to do with my ability to do the job. And so I'd say this Illinois Act was a bit of a, a reaction to the, the press coverage with because there was a significant amount at that time about these types of tools. But but I'd say it laid out some characteristics that we've seen follow through in many of these laws. Um, and the first is just that the that there be a disclosure to the candidate that artificial intelligence is being used in the selection process. Mm -hmm. the The second, um, and and this really gets back to that point about people not understanding how these tools were actually job related. Um, is that the there has to be a disclosure about the types of characteristics for which the tool is screening. Um, under the, the Illinois statute, there's a consent requirement. So the individual has to consent to the use of AI to score their video interview. And then, and so I'd say that was initially kind of the bundle of issues we saw is this idea of, you know, transparency. Mm -hmm. So um, that there's notice that AI is being used. And then some sense of, I'd say, informed consent. So you're you're giving individuals enough information about what the tool that both that the tool is being used and and what it's being used for that they can make an informed decision whether to opt out or not. Um, more recently, we've seen the state of New York. Um, I'm sorry, the city of New York adopt a local law around the use of what they call automated employment decision tools. Mm -hmm. In hiring, and, and frankly, it has many of the same characteristics that we saw in the Illinois law, except it's much more, it applies more broadly because it applies not just to video interviews scoring, um, 
being scored by artificial intelligence, but it applies more broadly to you know a whole range of um, artificial intelligence uses to make hiring decisions um, or promotional decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, like the like the Illinois law, it requires you know disclosure that AI is being used. It requires information about the characteristics that are being screened for. It, it's a little bit different from the Illinois ordinance in that or Illinois law in that rather than requiring consent, it requires that there be an opt out so that an individual can opt out of or request accommodation from the use of artificial intelligence. And then I think what was new about this law is it also requires some, um, it has some reporting obligations. Mm -hmm. So employers who use a automated employment decision tool um, are required to do an analysis of whether the tool has adverse impact based on race and gender. And then before they deploy the tool, they have to post the results of those analyses um, so that members of the public, you know, can go online and see is this a tool that's likely to have adverse impact based on race um, or gender. There, I'd say that that law started off with a kind of nebulous definition of artificial intelligence. It's it's narrowed since the law was first drafted through a couple of sets of proposed rules. Um, and I'd say it's narrowed in a couple of ways. The first is, um, you know, an initial read, it looked like the law basically applied anytime math was being used <laughs> in a decision. Um, so just a simple scoring algorithm might be enough to get under the law. Um, the proposed rules made clear that we're really talking about the use of machine learning and similar tools where, it, you know, there, there's a machine, not a person, deciding what the inputs are, deciding what the outputs are, refining those. Um, in, in a way that's not, um, you know, that that's the machine doing that rather than a person doing that. Mm -hmm. um, the second piece of the definition that I think has become more clear is that it's really focused not on the use of AI in the selection process, but the use of AI to either actually make the decision or substantially influence the decision. So it's really you know, if, if AI is the tiebreaker or if it's, you know, the majority of the decision is made by AI, then it's covered. If the AI tool is one data point in a much larger overall process and it's not the predominant data point, um, it wouldn't be covered. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd say what, what is probably missing from that law is any attention to the question of validity. Mm -hmm. So so really it says, you know, you. You've got to tell us what your tool is screening for, or tell the world what your tool is screening for, and tell the world whether it has disparate impact based on race and gender. But it 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 doesn't embrace this concept that's been around in kind of you know the the law of pre-employment selection since the late seventies that it you know a tool can have adverse impact but still be lawful if it's valid. Um, it, and so I'd say that that's something that's sort of oddly missing from that law. I guess at the same time, it doesn't require affirmative proof of validity. So, you know, at, at least in terms of the burden on employers, they're not required to to make that affirmative showing, although, frankly, they've already got that obligation under federal law. Yeah, and that's that's interesting. So, the you know, part of the work that that we do here at Perceptual is that we do that audit and compliance work related to New York 144. And one of the questions that we get a lot um, before we start working with with clients is they say, you know, we're we're gonna we're gonna do this audit and we're gonna put the results on our website. One of the funky things about New York 144 is that it doesn't have really a pass fail feature, right? The pass is you you do this audit and you put it on the website regardless of what the data shows. Um, but then of course the next question that that they'll have is what happens if we do this audit and it shows that there is adverse impact? We put it on our website. We satisfy the state of New York, but what happens? What happens then? How how do you how do you counsel a client in that situation? Yeah, so so I think in in those situations, I point back to their obligations under the federal law, and I say, you know, technically under the federal law, your obligations aren't triggered unless the the tool is shown to have adverse impact. But my advice is, if you're if you're using a tool, and especially using a tool at scale. It, it's better to have done the validity study before you roll the tool out rather than after you roll it out, find out it has adverse impact, and then are scrambling after the fact to show that it was always already valid. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, so what I've been advising clients is, you know, now that you're going to have to be posting these data online, um, you'd better have done that validity study work in advance, even though the New York ordinance doesn't require it. Um, I am certain that plaintiffs' attorneys will be scraping employers' career sites to see what they're saying mm -hmm. about adverse impact and gearing up to bring claims um, under federal law, because now they, they will have evidence that the tool had adverse impact that they won't already have had. So if the employer is in a place where, where when the plaintiff's attorney comes knocking, they can say, yes, and here's our validation study report showing that this is a valid tool, um, that allows them to, to hopefully head off those claims rather than, again, having to scramble to try to demonstrate that the tool is valid after they've already gotten a claim. Okay. Yeah, that's very, that's super helpful. Um, let's turn with the, with the last couple of minutes that we have. So we've talked about this, this New York law. We talked about the Illinois law. What else is on your radar? What are you, what are you watching closely? Yeah, I, I'd say there's a, so maybe th three areas I'm watching. The, the first is, as I mentioned before, you know, the federal enforcement agencies have started to take an interest in this area. I, I know the EOC and the OFCCP, um, are both looking into developing guidelines around the use of artificial intelligence in hiring and and, and in other talent management practices. So I wouldn't be expect I wouldn't be surprised to see those coming out soon. Um, in fact, the EEOC late last year already came out with some guidance around the potential of artificial intelligence to um, disparately impact people with disabilities. Um, and kind of in line with that general idea of transparency, they are suggesting that um, employers provide information about the AI-based tools that they use that would allow someone with a disability to know whether or not they should request a reasonable accommodation. Mm -hmm. um, so we've already got the EEOC starting to move into that space. I'm certain they're going to to move more fully into that space with additional guidance. Um, the second piece I'd say is we see what I, I call copycat legislation. Um, I know there has been proposed legislation in New Hampshire and New Jersey, for example, mm -hmm. that that tracks the New York City ordinance almost word for word. So we're, we're going to see similar standards. Um, the third, and this is the one I'm probably paying the most attention to, is California currently has a proposed law. It's I think it's being heard by a committee next, well, I guess the, the 11th, so just in less than a week. Um, and, th and that one is interesting because I'd say for two reasons. The first, well, three reasons. Um, the first is that it, it applies both to employers and assessment providers, so or AI tool providers. So it doesn't just put the onus of compliance on the employer. Mm -hmm. um, and I should say, I, I think of it in terms of employment, it actually applies across the board to all kinds of things, um, housing, uh, criminal justice, mm -hmm. sort of you name it, every aspect of life, it, it would apply to the use of AI. But, but one of those aspects is employment. Um, so, so the I, again, the, I'd say the first piece of that is that. Um, well, I mean, let me take a step back. So, so the the things I find interesting about it are first um, that unlike these other statutes, it actually requires some discussion of validity. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 second, which I guess is the first one I mentioned earlier, is that it applies both to employers and assessment providers. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third is that it um, it has, I would say, broader application in terms of how it defines artificial intelligence. Although, like the New York City ordinance, it is still limited to tools that are really, you know, outcome determinative rather than being a single data point. Um, but it but it does have a broader definition of artificial intelligence sitting be behind that. Um, and then, and I know I'm probably going over three, but there's actually a lot of interesting aspects to the law. Um, another is that it doesn't focus just on the potential for disparate impact based on race and gender, but it includes a number of other protected characteristics um, that employers will have to show that their tool doesn't have a potential for adverse impact against those groups. 
which which I think may be difficult for many employers to do because they're characteristics that aren't normally tracked in the application mm -hmm. process. And, and in fact, in, in many states would be unlawful to track those in the application process. So I, I think that's going to be an interesting uh, conundrum for employers to work through is how do they show that their tool you know doesn't have potential for disparate impact based on religion when they're not tracking information about applicants' religion at, at the time of application. Um, and then the last thing and probably the most worrisome is that, you know, the, the law will go into effect in 2025 mm -hmm. with respect to the kind of compliance and reporting obligations that are very similar to the New York ordinance. But then in 2026, if adopted, it will create a private right of action. So um, unlike these other ordinances where it's a civil enforcement scheme with a government agency overseeing it, um, the New York ordinance will allow for private lawsuits against employers um, for, for not complying with the requirements of the California law. Um, and that last so, one is, so I, go ahead. Yeah, go, sorry, go ahead, John. Well, that last one is really interesting. And so in your in your experience as uh, not just with, with AI, but over the last 20 years, how big of a deal is that private right of action? Like, does that really give the, the legislation more teeth or is it not, is it not as important? I'd say that's that that's a huge deal. Okay. Um, you know, this is uh, so. Some time ago, there was a, a U.S. Supreme Court decision called Dukes versus Walmart, uh, and I promise this will come back around. Um, but what the Dukes decision said is, you know, there are many types of employment decisions that don't lend themselves to treatment in a class action mm -hmm. um, because they're individualized decisions involving the discretion of individual decision makers. But certain things like a background check or a pre-employment assessment, um, because it's a across the board practice or policy, do lend themselves to you know big statewide or nationwide class actions. Um, and I'd say after the Duke's decision, I saw, I'd say a heightening of focus on um, you know, plaintiffs class action firms mm -hmm. focusing on things like pre-employment assessments um, and bringing big nationwide class actions. Um, focus on pre-employment assessments, criminal background check policies, things like that. Because after Dukes, you could still bring a big state or nationwide class action on those bases. Um, and I see, you know, this change or this this proposed California ordinance as being, you know, um, a place where we are going to see a ton of litigation because it's going to open the door for, you know, California um, plaintiffs firms to bring statewide class actions against employers who are are using um, AI based selection tools. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of takeaways, I know we talked earlier about potential takeaways for folks in HR. I, I have been surprised to learn um, how many of our clients may be using AI somewhere in their sourcing, recruiting, selection, screening, or or post-hire talent management processes that don't actually realize they're using it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's where I worry that, um, you know, many employers may be doing this already without realizing they're doing it, which is going to make it very hard for them to get into compliance. Um, until they get that lawsuit from someone saying, you know, I was screened by this tool, um, as were tens of thousands of other people. So I'd say if, if there's one cautionary note from all of this, it's for, you know, business leaders and HR folks to really um, scrutinize the tools they're using and, and reach out to their vendors if they don't already know to make sure that um, if to, to make sure that AI is not being used or if it's being used, that it's being used in a way that's compliant with these new legal regimes. Well, Mark, that's. Um, I think we'll we'll let that advice be the last word. That's super helpful. Um, we covered a lot of ground today, past, present, and future. So I want to thank you for uh, for your time. Um, and I always love to ask, uh, you know, what are what are the right clients for you? So if someone's listening to this and in their organization, how do they know that that Mark's the right person to call? Um. I would say, you know, we I, I have clients ranging from, you know, small single site entities to um, multinational, you know, Fortune 50 companies. So um, I'd say anyone that is using uh, selection tools at scale um, are probably the right, probably the right client.
Awesome. Uh, well, so we'll leave your contact information, your LinkedIn, uh, Mark. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Yeah, John, thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this.